Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. Thanks so much for joining. And let's see where our other participants are. Um, we are being joined by Lynn Nottage, by the director, Greg Daniel, uh, and hopefully Kermit. We are broadcasting now. This is great. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us after this wonderful reading of Kernel of Sanity, directed by Greg Daniel, written by Kermit Frazier. Um, we are going to start uh, a discussion in just a moment. I do want to thank uh, producers BJ, BJ Evans, Ryan Pointer, and Rosie Strube. Uh, and I want to also ask if you can please uh, do donate to Martha's Table. Um, and if you will note, there is a Q&A that one can fill out to ask questions uh, and mid-session we will be um, asking for questions. So uh, the question that I have right now is Kermit. Where is Kermit? It's <laughs> not with us uh, yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> A little hard to, to start this. This was uh, just an amazing thing that you've put together and the, the cast has put together in such a short amount of time. Um, to me as a playwright, it astonishes me what actors and a director can do. Um, I'll tell you what, what astonishes me is working on Zoom is kind of, it's, it's very new to me, obviously it's new to all of us, but since our cultural institutions have pretty much closed, and most theaters, legitimate theaters have said 2021, they'll resume, or we hope and pray that they'll resume operations. And we've sort of been forced to work on this new format, Zoom, StreamYard, whatever you want, whatever it is. And I just love the spirit of actors that will find a way to connect no matter what. I mean, being in different rooms, different locations, different states, actors still want to connect. It's organic, it's visceral. And I'm also, Paul, is sort of amazed when I see a scene happening and I'm thinking, Oh, they're not in the same space, are they? But you just see the eyes and the reactions physically, vocally. It's just really sort of wonderful. So it, it speaks to what you can do on Zoom, if even, if even forced, but also having Abigail Breslin and Josh Hamilton and uh, Matthew Hancock, yeah, those yeah. three actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were really tremendous cast and they were so committed and I, I felt so engaged throughout. And I'm curious, how, how long did you rehearse? We had about two, was it two days, three days? I think we had like two or three days, like a, a, a few hours each day to rehearse. But of course, our casting directors helped find some of the best. And, uh, and they came willing, they came wanting. You can go a long way as a director when you have actors who really savor and the material, who really want to chew the material. So even with the limited time we had, there was a commitment. Ah, Mr. Oh, Frazier, oh, playwright, well he's, with us. he's with us, he's with us. Well yeah. done, well That's done. Yeah. yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. It was really wonderful. So uh, once again, I just want to thank people for uh, joining us, participating uh, in seeing Kernel of Sanity. Um, and we have the uh, writer, Kermit Frazier, the director, Greg Daniel, who's also artistic director of the Lower Depths Theater, and Lynn Nottage, a beloved colleague, playwright, uh, who will be asking questions, moderating questions, uh, asking questions. And as we work our way through, um, join us. We'll have time to engage with some of the questions you may have. And so, yeah, thank you, Paula, for putting together the, this series. It was mm -hmm. really quite yeah. lovely getting introduced to this play and Kermit and Greg. I just, I really enjoyed the performances and hearing this play conjured for me a lot of complicated emotions. I was um, very struck by how the issues at the center of this piece still resonate with what's happening in theater today. The exploitation, the marginalization of black actors and the desire really for us to have our story centered. I know you wrote this um, play um, at a very specific moment in your life. Uh, yes. yeah. In 1978, you were living here in New York and you mm -hmm. just graduated from NYU and it was a different time. And so I'm wondering what it was like to revisit this old friend 
<laughs> well, first of all, it's like revisiting my life, you know. Um, I, yeah, I had been, I graduated in 1977 from NYU, and so did Greg. We were in the same class together. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. we were both acting, actors. Now Greg is a really great director, as well as still an actor. And I had, um, I, had, I had strange experiences working the first year with theaters and um, when I was doing, but I was also, I was also a writer. I mean, I, <clears throat> I was writing fiction. I was a fiction writer and I came to acting school as a fiction, as a, mm -hmm. someone who wanted to write fiction. And I had written many uh, short stories and uh, gotten, a, I was on my way to getting a couple of them published. And so this started as a short story, but I would also go to the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop and sit in on their readings. Uh, Garland Thompson and, and the folks up there would have readings of new plays. And it always excited me that everybody else, all these people were writing plays. And so when I came out of there once, I thought, well, wait a minute, what I'm writing now is really a play to me. So as I was doing Native Son off Broadway, and I, I did, and I did play the role of Jack. Um, I mean, I'm not Roger, okay. But I, I was playing the role of Jack and I started writing this play during the day. And I wrote it in a feverish pitch I finished the first draft in about a month. And then I started working on it. Uh, and it seems really, for me, I understand what, what I was trying to do back then, but, it's, but as a writer, I've taken so many different journeys that um, sometimes I wonder, well, you know, I'm a different person than I was back then in terms of working, me just in terms of maturity and also me in terms of, of a writer. But things still resonate. Um, so, was there any temptation when you got this the call from Paula to change anything, to update the references, to sort of get in there and rework right. any of the play? Yeah, no, not not really, because I think because my feeling was if the play doesn't if if what I was thinking of and working on back then does isn't relevant, then okay, don't do the play. But, but it doesn't make any sense to sort of, because every, every play you write, you know, you're moving someplace else to a different space. And I know that Tennessee Williams would go back and rewrite plays and give them different titles and things like that. But I really didn't have any interest in that. I wanted to see if this play would resonate still. And that's one of, the, that's one of my big questions for everyone in terms of the resonance. Does, does, does yeah, yeah, I think it does still have, um, 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 real resonance, particularly in this moment, you know, um, in which we're seeing Black Lives Matter and, and this uprising of these young people and this challenging of the white patriarchy on right. multiple yeah. levels and BIPOC people who are really pressuring white institutions to be more inclusive. It seems right. that at the heart of the story is Roger's struggle to shape his own narrative. But you also have Rita's marginalization and then you have um, Frank's transgressive refusal to see what's directly in front right. of him. And right. so it did feel quite relevant to me. Um, and your play felt like a real indictment of, of white theater um, back then, but it still felt like yeah. it could be a conversation we're having <laughs> today. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, you know, this groundswell of questions we're now facing and reflecting and asking ourselves. I mean, that's one of the things that makes the play so resonant, where we're taking a really hard look at white supremacy white power, white, it's it, it marginalization in a way that I, as soon as I read the play again, I had read it about 30, 40 years ago, it's like, oh yeah. And I was excited the fact that Kermit had created something that still had a resonance, that we weren't doing a museum piece, because I don't think either of us are interested in that, but we were doing something that might speak to this alienated black man's struggle yeah. of the many stories in there, this alien who's trying to find agency, who's trying to find a way to break through and take back the power or discover, invest his own power. And it's this, I get it. It's funny because when we were at NYU, I remember being one of the few students of color there. And here, so here we are in this system, largely this, this white uh, patriarchal system and struggling to learn the craft, learn, but also still trying to stay, stay who I was. I was a boy from Brooklyn. I was this little boy from Brooklyn. So this struggle, this almost uh, depression, 
of I've got to break through, I've got to break through, I've got to retain who I am, I've got to retain who I am. Even while going through the training and the craft, I need to retain who I am. It's a hell of a struggle. It is it's a, a struggle. struggle. And, and, and no, it's so interesting because I was speaking to some young actors earlier today, and mm -hmm. they're saying this is a struggle that's still very prevalent in institutions where they enter um, places like NYU with, right. with regional dialects and a strong sense of self, and they're told to hold on to their voice but at the same time, they're told to, that they have to blend into the system. And, right. and, and that is a real tension that I feel many who aren't BIPOC folks don't necessarily have to um, contend with. Right. right. The other thing for me, since we're talking about so students entering acting or whatever, and I was fresh out of acting school, one of the things for me that would interest me, for me, the play is also about performance. Yeah. That each of these characters performs as a way of trying to shape their own life, you know, and the stint, the, what, to what extent are we lying to ourselves and telling the truth of ourself when, as we perform through life? And even Rita performs, she tries, she, she's as, she doesn't lie, she pretends, she doesn't lie, she acts the role that she's trying to. Right, yeah, it feels like all of them are trying on different roles. Yeah, so trying on different whether they, roles. Yeah, whether they fit inside of them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, Paula, you're, you're here. I'm, I'm really curious about what drew you to this play in 1978 and hearing it again tonight, you know, what was the renewed resonance for you? Well, I mean, just personally, I, I have to thank everybody for making this happen because this has been in my head for <laughs> 42 years. And um, the night that I read it, it got inside and I couldn't shake it. And, you know, I... I have to say, with real respect to to Win Hanman, um, who had you know a very different aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, I was stunned when I read it and knew that this was a first play. I was stunned by the kind of exposure of the toxicity of whiteness and white masculinity, and I do think in in seventy eight and then you know on into the eighties. It felt like a very, it still is, a testosterone-driven theater um, without any critique that has then also evolved in terms of film. So I felt the kernel of sanity was giving me a, a real viewpoint that would turn around the camera um, mm -hmm from all of the roles that I was seeing, all of the notions of the white protagonist. Um, and uh, it, one of the really great delights uh, of this past month is being able to read through the astonishing body of work, Kermit, that you've made um, and that you're continuing to write and to see as a writer how you shift your strategies how at times there's lyricism, so there's theatricality. But to me, my question that stuck with me and remains is how does the theater not respond to extraordinary gifts on the page? Regardless of whether a company produces it or not, we have to give the resources of the theater to someone who writes such an amazing first play because the, the, we're your orchestra. How do you write com composition without an orchestra? So you know, that's, yeah, that's- I mean, it, it's so interesting hearing you say that, um, Paula, and I, I'm thinking back to 1978 because I remember I was not writing in, in theater yet, but I remember the struggle when I was trying to get my place produced in the early 90s, you yeah. know, and, and, and at a time when, African-American theaters were on the decline. They were not getting the support. They were not connecting with audi audiences for a multitude of reasons. And um, the mainstream off-Broadway um, theaters were just not interested in Black-centered stories. So in 1978, I can only imagine, Kermit, what your struggle <laughs> was to, um, to get a play like this, which was multicultural, Right. which really pointed a finger directly at the white patriarchy and, and challenged fo folks to um, confront it. 
Um, and, and so I was just interesting about the climate in 1978 for an aspiring writer. I heard you speak of Frank Silvera's workshop, and I think that there are a lot of people who are part of this um, Zoom group who don't know what that is. Yeah, and the, don't know Lloyd Richards and who don't necessarily know Woody King. Right. So can you talk a little bit about who those folks were? Sure. I are. mean, well, you know, actually there were in, in New York, in New York, of course, there, there was the African-American Total Theater, there was the New Heritage Theater, there were several sort of off-off-Broadway African-American theaters that, that did work. Um, budgets were small. And uh, it was difficult to move a play from from the kind of showcase situation into into a, a lot for a larger audience and sort of make sort of spin a living out of that as a writer. And one of the things that was important about the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop is that you could read just beginning plays, and they had two re they had two readings a week, one on a Monday night and one on Saturday. So the the bigger plays were people who had larger reputations that got the Monday night slots. So Colonel Sanity was read on a Saturday Saturday morning, but that was fine. I mean, I had an opportunity to have it read there. And Woody King took an interest in the play right away. Um, but it's just, you know, you just, sometimes you just can't do things. I mean, and I decided after the O'Neill, uh, Lloyd took me under his wing and and I had a chance to workshop it at the O'Neill a, a year later, but then it also didn't, things didn't happen. But what happens then, and I speak to young writers too, the next, what you have to do is you have to move on. You right. can't like let, I moved on to the next play. And I just kept moving on until I could finally, maybe someone would, maybe somebody would want to do this one, or maybe this one, or maybe this one. But I always wondered, you know, where Colonel Sanity would fall and when it would be done. And so when Woody finally, 30 years later in 2009, said, oh, now we can do this play, um, then we had a showcase production. But it's a showcase production, you know, you know, under 40 performances. And then, OK, that's it. And um, well, Paul and I have already talked about the reviews about it. so. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 back then, yeah, it was you know the Frank Silvera Writers Workshop was a way for a lot of writers, African American writers in this in New York City, to see plays read. Um, they you know they wouldn't necessarily go anywhere from there, but it was a way of like show, showing your work. And then moving on from there to try to try to develop even more plays. So, and as an actor as well, I remember being an actor that would go up to uh, Frank Silver and be yeah. and get to read a new play. It was so exciting. I mean, the energy was just electric because we had these young actors like myself who was reading these new works, and we had the writers there. It was just this incubator of ideas going on, and the Negro Ensemble Company, of course, on St. Mark's Place, yeah. and the Pulitzer Prize winner. They got so many wonderful writers, Leslie Lee, and it was just so many resources for that. Absolutely, and. I I've been supporting Kermit, I'm proud to say, for at least 30, 40 years. I mean, we just did a reading of his latest play, another three-hander. What, was it earlier this year, uh, Kermit? In March, you before the lockdown. The year yes, before the lockdown. Just, just before the lockdown. He flew out to Los Angeles and we did a reading of his play. I mean, I, I love his work. I just love the muscularity and the intelligence of his work. And wherever, whatever he's got, I want to say, let me read it. And then if we can arrange any kind of a, 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 a in-house read of it, just so the playwright can hear the work, I am always at his service because I just believe in him as a playwright. So I was so pleased when Paula Vogel said, hey, let's revisit these works. <laughs> and Colonel was Sanity with Kermit was one of them. I was thrilled. Yeah, I just I want to say one quick thing about Frank Silvera's because I remember when I first came back to New York as a young playwright, I was told that I had to get into the workshop at Frank Silvera's. <laughs> right. That was going, that had to be my first stop, and I did, and I went up there, and I met Garland Wright, and I did, you know, have the good fortune of having um, a pl play read within that workshop and sort of basking in in that energy. But I wanted to circle back to the play just for for one moment. Um, and, and, and just talk a little bit about Roger. And I found it really interesting that throughout the play, he's simmering, that he's like, he's so boil until the rage finally bubbles forth and it becomes something that's recognizable and really quite palpable. But at the end of the play, I was really, really curious as to why you let Frank off the hook. Um, in what way? In what, in, 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 um, 
in number one, the gun isn't real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it seems as though there is some level, and I could be wrong, and this may be my misinterpretation, of uh, some level of, of forgiveness or recon yeah. to reconciliation. Right. Yeah, it's, that was, you know, the play, well, well, you know, and all writers know that, that a play can evolve and change. Um, it's, it's hard to, to find sometimes um, where, where things, where things are in something that you've written. And at, at one point there was a real gun. At one point, um, there were shootings. At one point, there were, you, you know, there was, I was, I was more, I, I became more, less interested in whether or not I'm going to let Frank off the hook and more about what is Roger's journey? What is he going to take away from this? And, and so I, I think that Roger recognizes that there are elements in Frank that are important to him in terms of his own maturity and his own development. And short of like beating him to death in terms of letting him off the hook i th i think that my my sense is that frank recognizes needs to recognize that his way of existence is bogus um and and i'm hoping that that's maybe what what roger has has brought to it but um but it's a it's a it's a it's a i don't have the answer to that len really i don't yeah, I mean, you know, that might speak to a kind of weakness in the play in terms of the progression of Frank's character and how where he's going to go and where he's going to move. No, I, I, you know, I found it was something that that invited me to engage with it and to ask, you know, yeah. more questions, you know, and so I was just really super curious about that choice. Right. The, in, the, in the first draft of the play, um, Roger kills Frank and Rita. Mm. That was the first draft. That was the impulse that I had. Okay, and so you say, you know, you know, it's not a reveal. It's just my 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 involving of the play. And for me, I pull back from that because that's not what Roger. That that does not. That that's doing. Uh, that doesn't help Roger. It doesn't help where he wants to move to. And I said, no, you can't. That's not, a, that's not Roger's solution. Roger has to have a, another kind of solution. So that's when I sort of moved into the whole sense of him coming in and proving that he, so that he can perform, that he's an actor of strong, a strong, perform, of strong performance. And then the question becomes then, did he or did he not do what he said he did in the way he said he did it or is he is acting so good that he has them convinced at the end, and you know, and it only occurs to Frank that he says, "Well, maybe he's not. Maybe he is. Is he or is he not?" I mean, that question still hangs in the air, you know. Uh, but it was only the first draft that sort of kind of murderous kind of. Um, so you got it out of your system. Yeah, I got it out of my <laughs> system. To, yeah, to, yeah. To I, I toyed, and it was interesting, and it was, it was, and it was, it was, it was great for me, but it didn't, it didn't help me with Roger. Right. But, right. But that to happen, it didn't help me with Roger. I, I see you, Paula. It looks like you want to say something. That that's the draft I read. Yeah, that's the draft. I I had, and so when I got, got this draft from Kermit, I thought, oh my God, I'm losing it. I just imagined this ending that not existed. So um, that's all. But you know, for me, what was important, there are things that Roger gets Frank to say, to verbalize in his presence that I think, and maybe I'm the eternal optimist, but might begin his path of reconciliation with himself. Roger, for the first time, certainly in front of Rita and with Rita's aid, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, says uh, what it was really like out there in the coast. He was a, you know, he was a substance abuser. He, he found some level of fame or work, but he fled back here because he really wasn't going anywhere. So just to give, it's almost like he gives up his power or, or the illusion of power in front of Roger by saying, no, guy, I... You know, I did this, I did that, and I had, to, I was compelled to come back here. It's my only chance, my only hope of beginning again. 
I don't know what the exact line is, Kermit, but he has to, it, he had to come back to this incubator to start again. And in that moment, I, for me, I felt that, okay, Roger can begin his process now of going, I don't have to wrench the power from this guy. He doesn't have any power. It's an illusion. He never had any power. Yeah, he had some talent that I was fascinated with when I was younger, but he doesn't have the power that I invested him with. So I'm going to now, okay. Because I thought that was a wrong choice too. I thought, not wrong choice, but when Curran moved away from the killing, it thought, okay, no, no. And he's a better writer than that anyway. To, 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 then it becomes about the violence and playing out the big black beast and all that crap. But uh, that, for me, that was much more interesting. The fact that he makes Frank admit something fundamental to himself in front of the press, in the presence of, uh, of uh, Rita, and then he realizes it's time to go. We definitely, by the end, do have the real sense of Roger reclaiming power and leaving the, you know, leaving the space with his, right. you know, his, his held head held high. Um, right. I think in, in, um, now, um, because we've been speaking for some time, uh, might be a good moment to entertain some questions from um, folks on Zoom. Sure. Um, uh, one of the questions uh, is, this is a fun one, what did the actors think of the play and how do they connect with the, its themes while performing this play? Do we have the actors here? Are they here? Any actors present? I don't know. Um, Greg, can you maybe? Well, I know, uh, sure. for instance, Abigail's in love with Janis Joplin. She's a, a, Abigail's also an amazing singer. But just the persona and the myth of Janis Joplin and that voice, that, that small town girl who was tormented in a way and found her power in the voice. Abigail immediately, Abby really connected with that. She loves Janis Joplin. She loves her voice. And even in that section, when she would go through the section about Janis, I always found it magical. She just managed to sort of tap into something that was really, that was really resonant for her. I know Josh love the faker kind of persona. I mean, I even told him, okay, roll a joint and, you know, in truth there is, in marijuana there's truth. So really enjoy that, that, that be crystal clear while you're smoking this joint and getting high that your, what your voice is the voice. So he embraced that. He loved that. He loved that. And of course, uh, uh, Matthew. Matthew here, we have Matthew here, so. Matthew is okay. here. If we oh, I stop right there and give it over to Matthew. There we Hi. are, Matthew. Hi. Hey, wonderful. wonderful. There I go. Hey. hey. How are you? Hey. I'm so, well. How are you? Good. Uh, the audience had a question for you. Paula, you want yes. to throw it out again, please? So, so the question is, is uh, what do the actors th think of the play and how do you connect with its themes as you're uh, performing this? Well, I am a, I'm a Black actor. Um, this quiet fact, um, I actually was in the running to be uh, bigger out here uh, when they did Native Son. Um, uh, so there, there are a lot of similarities to um, Roger and I in that, you know, being being black is one thing, but then also to the perception of, of who you are. You know, sometimes I've noticed that, you know, they want when they want somebody black, they want somebody big and black. They don't want somebody that, that comes off more intellectual. You know, oftentimes they, they we we're celebrating stories because of strength and not our intellect. So it's things like that, that when you get a, a piece like this, you're like, oh, yeah, I, I know this quite well. That's great. Um, here's a, a, a question I think for everyone, which is artistic directors usually develop BIPOC, but how does one get past the trap of being in development to get on the production track? Is a question from one of our participants. Oh boy, that's a <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is well, the question. Only because I know playwrights get in development hell. I just know when it goes yeah, to work, you know, yeah. it's Lynn and Kit Kermit. When uh, they're interested, a uh, uh, theater contacts you, you contact them, and then they workshop and they workshop it again. But no one ever promises or commits themselves to a production. It's so tough on the playwright when that happens. They just want the play at some point in the chain to get mounted, and it's a uh, it's a tough decision. Kermit, Lynn, how do you do that? Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think that it's one of the dilemmas of being a, um, a playwright is how do you move your work, you know, from reading to workshop to pr production. And I think it's one of the things that, particularly for BIPOC people, that we're trying to change because so often theaters raise um, money on the backs of BIPOC folks 
and, and satisfy those grants from foundations by merely giving readings and workshops. And so we really have to pressure the theaters to move toward production. Right. It's, it's, it, there was a kind of, I remember in the 80s, and I know I was, I don't know whether she, we will mention the theater, but I was briefly in a sort of minority workshop with you, Lynn, and I think it was Kia Coltrane and... Yeah, it was a play, well... It was there. Oh. We, we, we <laughs> can actually say it. I actually believe in transparency yeah. now. Yeah, it, it was Playwright a, Horizon. Playwright Horizons. It was Playwright <laughs> Horizons, you know, when Tim was the literary manager before he became artistic director. And... And during that time period, I remember it was the 80s, that there was money available and a lot of the white majority theaters would, would go to the government for that money, create these sort of minority spaces, and that's where the money went. But it didn't mean that you were going to go any, anywhere but in that minority space. So you sort of ran around underneath the, the majority space. But then the, the, the money went there. And I know that that African-American theaters would complain because, wait a minute, you are taking the money and our uh, BIPOC playwrights and everything, you know, what do we do? Where, how can, how can we, uh, and, and, I, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know whether that's still going on, I think. Yeah, I, I think it is still going on. And I remember very specifically in that Playwrights Horizons group that finally we were forced to pressure the theater um, and say to them, it's like, we will disband this group right. unless one of our plays is produced next season. Right. And, and, and finally they had to because there was money that was flowing into the theater that yeah. they were dependent on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, right. Um, I love this question, um, which is, uh, where can we see the next production of Colonel of Sanity? <laughs> um, I think it's very much to the point, and um, well, the theater uh, I, shut down. So, well, I think I think I'm going to be asking this question following this um, discussion on on Twitter and and Facebook. Um, can you talk about the title and the themes of sanity and mental health? Is another question. Right. Um, I. I you know, I think that, um, well, first of all, Frank is gaming the system. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think that, that um, when, when one is performing, when one is doing, when one is sort of using self to, to, to do various characters, there's a kind of insanity about that in the sense that you are allowing yourself to be, you know, to, to step outside and, 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 and be something else. And then you, and then there's a point where you need to pull back and say, okay, now I'm, I, I'm done and I can walk off. And some people can't do that. Some people, you know, they, 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 that's with them all the time. And, and I think that, that for Roger, how do I stay, where where is that self that's sane? That self that that I can live with? That self that will that'll keep me keep me whole? Uh, yeah. Am I black enough? Am I whatever enough? All all of that sort of thing. So this whole notion about sanity, I think, for also has to do with you know what is your true self? What is the true self that you that you walk around with? And how do you? Uh, how do you live with that without going insane? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, Frank is trying to create his own sort of a image of a of, of a, a kind of sanity within this bubble of a house that he lives in. Um, but um, I mean, that's you know, beyond a sort of little metaphor, I can't. Unless somebody else has some ideas about what Colonel. I know what the original title was, but I'm not even sure I want to say that. No, I do, but but sometimes, definitely in this um, business, you do feel gaslighted. Yeah. <laughs> right. The whole, and then the whole premise of this, the whole premise of this business is artifice, anyway. So I think it's always interesting when yeah. the mask goes on and when the mask comes off. You can. It's a very slippery slope. When are we performing just to be safe? As I know, you know, in order to be safe in certain areas from certain segments of the population, I won't say the police, but I know the voice and things that I do to just subtly, very subtly, and with nuance, 
to protect myself, the mask goes on. And sometimes when, the, and, and, and it gets confusing at, at times, especially in this society, of when I, as a black man, have to protect myself by assuming this identity, but then I, I can be this way, but then where is the intersection between the one that has to protect and show this face to be less threatening and the one who truly really is just who he is? That's, um, that's pretty fertile territory <laughs> to delve into. Yeah, yeah. I think the other actors are here, by the way, Paul. I don't know if you knew that, but I yeah, think um, you could, uh, I see some. Is everybody here? Because it's interesting. We, we started our conversation with this, but I think uh, this is a moment in terms of, of having you, Greg, with the actors. Um, and for us as playwrights, how long we're going to be doing this as Zoom instead of uh, being back in the theaters is a question that you were talking about when we began. And we're getting a number of questions. So uh, Josh and Matthew, uh, I don't know, are, is Abigail here, Miata? The questions are coming up about how, uh, how was your experience directing remotely? What is it like for the actors? How do you maintain a contact? and increase the intensity that this play demands not being in the same room, which I think was so successfully done. And I really want to hear these answers because I do think we're going to be in this format. As you were saying, this may be here for a while. This is the new reality. Yeah. 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 Were you saying something, Kermit? Yes, it is. It is. Well, yeah. I mean, what do you feel, Len? I mean, it's like, you know, you, you've had everything shut down, they were postponed and so on. I, you know, it, I, I literally had my life interrupted. Uh, <laughs> like Paula, for a long period of time, I was very resistant <laughs> to the notion of, of switching to Zoom. But, but um, I'm really interested in, in, in this moment um, of how we can tell stories across multiple platforms and yeah. not just Zoom, but how we can use in um, TikTok and, and, and Instagram and Twitter and all these other tools that we have to, to uh, engage audiences in real time, because I want to figure out how can we recreate that intimacy and that communal sense that um, is so important to us as theater makers. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Josh, Matthew, Miata, how is, what, what is this? Uh, Abigail, if you're here. Okay. Um, Come on, guys. Come it's on. a what, really uh, what is this act? yeah. What happened? It's a, it's a trippy, it? trippy process. Um, <laughs> I know I have a hard Gotta time hide. because I, I, I was a dancer first, so I, 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 I normally lead with physicality and movement, and obviously we, we only have so much to work with, uh, with this little box. Um, but I'm noticing that the, even that has its own little nuance to it, and. Um, it's, it becomes much more of a mental exercise though, for me, there's definitely, it takes a lot, a lot more focus, um, in this, in this thing, because you, you, this is all we've got, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was just, was this um, yeah, well, I have so far, um, working with Greg, I have been doing stage directions for the past two things that I've done with Greg. I think what's been awesome is watching Greg figure out new ways to make it as theatrical as possible. So having actors enter and exit, which I was like, ooh, that's amazing. And having actors in this play use props. So even like my husband was watching, he was like, they passed the, 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 the portrait, like watching them pass it and receive it. Yeah. I think just finding really interesting ways of trying to still engage your audience has just been really, really interesting. And so, um, I know it's not ideal and it's certainly kind of awful when you're like, oh my God, my mic's going out. Like you're sitting here trying to actually like, my mic's going out. You you're don't have someone. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have someone like you're like, my lighting is terrible. Greg's like, I see the under, Jack, Greg's like, I don't want to see your chin. And you're just like, okay. So you're trying to do all these things, but it's been really wonderful to keep acting in this space. And so it's going to be exciting to keep seeing new ways of making it more and more alive for audiences. Yeah, I had never worked with props before and that was a, a new and fun thing, but it added so much, even for me sitting here in my room by myself, I was in the world. So it, was, it, it actually all built in and, and upon itself. You know, I guess the only thing with Zoom is that you don't have them in the same space, but you still have to reinvest what, what actors connect with. Text, musicality, tempo, 
I mean, there are certain immutable tenets of acting that you know, handling something. So I'm beginning to sort of trust that any good actor, actor, any facile shall I say, actor, if you get, and I knew if I threw these, these actors, I, you know, they have enough going for them that if I introduce the prop or two, it's never at the expense of the text, I'll throw it away if I say, it gets in the way to get about it, but actors want to connect, so you have to go back to what the basics are, you know, what's the operative words, what's the text, what's the musicality, what's the, what's the theme, what are you trying to gain here? If you go back to those things, and this is purely tech, as a director, then you can lead them a, 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 an available open actor, you could lead them to those things. And that's been a revelation. Lynn, I was like you, I was a purist. I said, this has nothing to do with theater. This is, this is a bastardization, oh my God. And then finally I got off this self-righteous bid and said, well, I do want to keep working. I do want to keep bringing stories like this. So what am I going to do? And, 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 and thankfully I found the same building blocks, that DNA, that actors need to uh, be in a scene, you can still you can still bring back to Zoom, absolutely. Yeah, no, what's interesting because as theater artists, we are improvisational. And since um, the, the, the pandemic be, began, um, I have done three full workshops wow. of plays, <laughs> which I thought were going to be completely impossible and taken something from each of those workshops that helped me improve the piece. So I think, you know, the initial resistance and obstacles uh, are beginning to sort of fade away as we realize there are other, there are other ways you can engage with this medium that um, are helpful. Right. And, and, and is it the basic, is it obstacles is what sort of drive us on, uh, artists? I mean, the obstacles is usually what give us this kind of energy. That's the, the energy just, that's, that is started as a result of facing an obstacle and going through that obstacle or trying to confront that obstacle. That's what creates kind of the heat and the energy. So this is just an obstacle that we can use, as you said, in those workshops you had. Uh, I'm about to come up on one now. I'm thinking, well, maybe we should just cancel. A new writer, uh, not a new writer, but a new play. Uh, do we want no, to workshop no. for six days? But Absolutely don't. Thank you. I, yeah. uh, I'm going to remember when not, it said, go do the, um, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Obstacles. Paul. Paula there, I was looking at the chat. Are we doing the chat? These There's some qu specific questions about uh, Roger and Rita and so on. Are there, is, is uh, Rosie choosing some of those Rosie questions? Rosie is choosing. I think the Q&A has more than the chat. Um, <laughs> Because no, I mean, I, the Q, I mean the Q&A. That's what I mean, the Q&A. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat, not the Q&A. Yeah, in the Q&A, there, there are all these questions about, is Rita this? Does Roger so-and-so? Uh, there's one for Greg. Um, and I'm wondering how we go about. We, we probably have another 15 minutes. So um, if there's a, a, a question on the Q&A, I'm... I, I see one question that I would like to go ask. for it, please. Um, someone's asked me, uh, could you imagine that when you wrote this play? I'm about to ask you that, yeah. Um, that it would be. Uh, as timeless as it is. As timeless as it is. And my answer to that is no, I have no idea. I just, you know, you just tell stories. I mean, you hope that someone would be interested in it. But I wasn't imagining 2020. I wasn't imagining even, I don't know, a year beyond 1978. Again, you have an idea, you have a story you want to tell, and the, the best you can do is try to be as truthful to that story in, at that moment that you want to tell. And maybe you can hope that someone would be interested down the line. But I, yeah, I don't know. Paula, you made me think about this play in relationship to this time, you know? Well, it's, but I, I think that something- Because it's my said, first play, not my, not my 20th, so I'm not thinking way back. Right, you know. but, but I, I, one of the interesting things, and I, I don't mean to uh, diverge from the list that people are asking here, because there's some great topics on this. You said 1978 is today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's such a provocative thing to say. 
-hmm. but also the reason why it is so important that you know we get to hear the why the how is it the same how do we break this from being the same that um and the, the second question on this is, how do you feel that it is timeless? That's the second part of that question, that 1978 is today. What do I, well, I, I feel happy and lucky. I mean, that, you know, no one wants your, their play to sort of like be old hat and go out. So I'm, I'm surprised, I'm just surprised at that. And I think that, yeah, I'm surprised at that. I'm really happy about that. I mean, um, again, I don't know about you, Lynn, but you know, after I finish a play and I go to the next thing, I that's the thing I'm thinking about. You know, I mean, that's really true for for me as well. It's like I, I can't I can't continue to rewrite and rethink something all um, old. I have to continue to move on. Um, right. There is a question that was in in the chat that I want to ask because I, I think it's relevant is um, how can um, someone find the rest of your work permit? Are you, are, do you have your, are you, is there a collection or anthology or your place published? Where can one go? Well, uh, my, uh, my, my primer, my publisher is Broadway Play Publishing. Okay, great. I have five plays available. So just go online to Broadway P Play Publishing. I have, uh, Legacies and Firepower and American Journey and actually Colonel of Sanity is actually published there too. Um, and then I have only one other place and that's Dramatic Publishing. And I have a play, Smoldering Fires, is published there. Uh, other than that, I need more productions. <laughs> so they're, not, they're not collected. Although I'll, I'm gonna pressure my publisher now and say, let's collect them together, you know, and so. But mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's where you go. That's it would you, be great to have an anthology or two yeah. of the works of Kermit Fraser. Yeah. Um, an, another question that's on uh, the chat, if I may, is uh, this person says, one of my favorite moments is when Roger mentions diluted blackness. Uh. Can you all go into more of what that means and, and how that plays a part in the black experience today is the question. Matthew, you say the word, you say the line, so we're going to throw you on the store first. You, you say the line. Uh, well, I think, you know, it's, it's measuring yourself against the white gaze, which we so often do. And I know um, I'm very guilty of what they call code switching. You know, there are certain ways that I will talk to friends and family, you know, of like background that I will not talk to, you know, people, Caucasian people or, or, or people that I don't know um, uh, because, like I said before, there's a perception about black people. And I know coming from the home I came from, education was always first. So we always would want to present ourselves um, without slang or, or, or things like that. But then, you know, when you get around your friends, you, you can slip into those types of things. So when, I, when we say diluted blackness, and we're taking it to the um, perspective in which Roger's coming from, he's coming from a place where he went to the drama school. He's gotten the, the rudimentary, you know, uh, training to, to speak without an accent or to speak without... Uh, sounding quote unquote black, um, and so that that sort of molding can kind of leave you uh, in some sort of shell of yourself if you if you don't learn how to do the code switch. Honestly, yeah, and it's a burden to do the code switching. Code switching is a burden, guys. Code switching is tiring. It code is trying to figure out any given circumstance. I'm at a party. I'm like, okay, so who am I going to be now? So I'm not threatening anyone. I'm being accepted. I feel it's a lot of work. It is traumatic. It's post-traumatic stress when black people are always trying to figure out what face am I showing at any given time. In fact, in that, it's interesting that that uh, question because. Kermit has this beautiful, it's three, it's a series of three things you mentioned, Kermit, and then you end at diluted blackness, which is like a score. Do you remember what they were, Kermit, the three? Uh, what are they, Matthew? <laughs> Hold on, contemplative. Memorize it. Oh, you got to, you got to Contemplative, uh, uh, con contemplative, oh, you put me on the spot, damn it. <laughs> Sorry, well, it's just, again, the musicality of how, and then he lands, like any good writer, in terms of rhythm and musicality, how he yeah. lands on the last one, 
dilute. So we actually worked that a little. Remember, Matthew, we worked that a little bit because the sound of it was it was so set up to be these two things which sounded cold and remote, and then finally diluted blackness lands at the end of the phrase. Like, wow, I get it now what Rogers, the revelation Rogers. So again, it's a skillful writer playing with rhythm language uh, and who knows what he's doing, what they're doing. And I, I did want to add just diluting blackness to um, in that it also leads to the rage, right? So uh, that's one of my favorite parts about Raj, why he has all this rage throughout the play. I have been in situations where I reminded someone that I was black because <laughs> I, I have been doing the same thing. I had been diluting my blackness the whole time. I never said anything about being black. I code switched the whole time. And instead of making them respect me more, it made them respect me less. So when I finally reminded them that I was black and asking them to support something I was doing, a black led project, they said, oh, we thought you were ashamed of being black. Like a white person said that to me. And it was so angering for me because blackness is one of the few things I've never been ashamed of. And it just, and then it was a person though that I had to continue to work with. They were in a position above me and it just led to more and more rage for me. So like, that's why for me, the play rings so true because we've all been in situations where we've had people disrespect our blackness and then we have to keep taking away our blackness and then that doesn't make them care about us anymore it doesn't make us any closer to whiteness but we have to continue to do it because our blackness is threatening to them so i totally it resonated with me so much all of the pain roger has walking into that space because we've all been there here's here here are the threes of that too uh thank you i lost them um Quiet intelligence, mm -hmm. contemplative seriousness, diluted blackness. And I think for Roger, he's, he is all of those things. You know, you know, this, you know, oh, you're so quiet, or you're so smart, or you talk so well. All of those sorts of things that are sort of indications that you are the kind of black person that is okay, you know. You, one of the good but ones. it also, one of the but good it ones. also, but it also means, and this is what I think rages Roger. The negative part of that of okay is you're not threatening. And the moment you tell, the moment you say non-threatening means you don't have any kind of power that I'm afraid of, or you are in terms of the whole masculine thing. You're less than a man. So it is, you know, are you bigger Thomas or are you? I mean, bigger Thomas for me, bigger Thomas in the play plays against um, um, Thomas Pynchon, plays against postmodern white writers. So does it, there's this tension between, and Frank has no idea what Roger is talking about. Frank does not understand, Frank does not know that fear, flight, and fate are the three chapters of Native Son. He just adds a joke and says, fucked. <laughs> So, so there is a, there's a miscommunication between, you know, what, who Roger is and who, and who Frank thinks a black person should be, because that's where he's headed. You know, it's like, this is the blackness I'm seeking. Mm -hmm. And, and Roger says, well, it ain't me. So what, what is it? Hey, Josh. Hi, Josh. Hey, sorry. Hey guys, I've been here the whole time. I couldn't figure out how to get my video or sound <laughs> thing. I'm, I'm, this is, this is, I'm. <laughs> Josh. We have a lot of questions, don't we, Paula? In the question and answer question. Yeah, the, the questions are great. We're going to be running out of time before the questions, but uh, a couple of, um, this has been asked just a couple of times about how do you feel about this play in this form without having the audience response, without hearing from the audience how did that affect you how did you know did you miss that were you aware of yeah of course yeah i mean i guess i feel this is my first time this is my this is my first zoom reading um and i mean i i guess it you know it's it's better than nothing i guess is how i is how i feel right now you know it's it's i think you know the desire to connect mm. is is so strong um and I guess it felt a little more, um, you know, usually when you're with, when you have an audience, you're very aware that, you know, you're sort of telling them the story. This felt a little more, um, 
it just felt more hermetic and almost, uh, it just, it, it felt a little indulgent in a way, like sort of like, I just wanted to say these words and, and try to connect with these actors um, just for my own personal um, pleasure, you know, but I didn't, you didn't have that sense of like, I, I, you have no sense of it. It's like when you work on a TV or film, it's like, it just feels like you're not, you have no, you don't know who you're doing it for. You don't know who's going to see it. Um, and then there's just the technical things of like, I don't know where to look on the computer. You know, I, I, sometimes I feel like it's most effective if you look right in the camera, but then you're not looking at someone's eyes. And then you just feel like you're doing this. And, and also you can see yourself. I probably should have turned myself off, but as you can tell, I'm not, I'm not very technically savvy. Um, <laughs> So you're like acting and then sort of catching yourself and trying not to look yourself and making sure you're at least in the frame. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I hope this isn't the future for that long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, folks, if I may to, to wrap up with one last question from our participants. Uh, this is the question. It's five years from today. What do you think the American theater looks like? Is anything different about the who's, what's, why's, and how's of plays getting produced? Hmm. Um, well, I can say, if, if my, I may respond, the optimistic yeah, Lynn believes that in this moment where there is so much pressure that's being brought to bear on um, sort of white institutions that in five years we will see a very lens, very different ecosystem within the American theater that it will resemble more um, um, more of the country, that there'll be more diversity and, and equity and that Broadway will be a place where everyone feels welcome, including the playwrights <laughs> and the, of color and the women. <laughs> Um, and, and, and so that's the optimistic, um, um, Lynn, is that, that there is this perfect storm that happened that allowed young people to remain in the streets and to remain angry for as long as they are, and that that will finally be heard. And my dream is that it won't take five years. My dream is that we use this moment in which theaters are closed to really interrogate those spaces and my dream is that I return to a space that looks very different than the space that I left. Hmm. Kermit, thoughts? That was beautiful. Well, you know, I, I, I hope that, uh, well, one of the things that's gonna have to change is the, the way that the theaters, especially white majority theaters, lean so heavily on a subscription season. Um, it was already beginning to crack anyway because young people don't subscribe full seasons to theaters the way um, their parents and grandparents do. And their grandparents and grandparents are not going to be living forever. And so I th that's, that's one of the things that's probably going to have to change for all theaters. How do, you, how do you have a season that you can plan without necessarily expecting this huge infusion of money from subscribers to buttress you that there's a that meet there needs to be other ways of funding individual shows and allowing people to choose i want to see this but not that and and find your audiences that way and then maybe then that's a way of of um of spreading spreading it out among um various groups of americans in in this country that uh, they'll get a chance to see, you know, their work as well. Uh, well but, I, but my big question is, what kind of federal government are we going to have? Yes, yes. What kind of government, a government that maybe is more interested in the arts, or are we going to go the other way, the way we have been going? less and less interested in funding the arts because that's going to be critical as well you know the investment that the, that whatever the new government is going to have and it will be a new government we hope right a new government that, we, is, that we're going to have <laughs> in the arts well i just 
want to say what an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to present this work. And I want to thank you all. Um, and Lynn, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, what a terrific conversation. And just a last note to us from someone uh, who is attending the webinar. Please know you connected. Mm -hmm. OMG, it leapt out of the screen. <laughs> it felt like being in the theater with you. I always sit in the front row, and I sat in the front row with all of you today. All right. So, oh, wow. on that yeah. note, my Paula, thank Paula, yeah. Paula, before you before you go, I'm thinking there are lots of questions. Some people have asked me some questions, and I think I don't know should I do this or not. But maybe I, I'd like to 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 supply my email address and if those who have questions specifically about the play or about anything that's going on Fantastic. email me and i will try to answer your emails uh, whenever i know a lot of people have moved away from email but anyway, i'm still doing it so uh it is c a g e y f x at aol.com C as in cat, A as in apple, G as in George, E as in elf, F as in fox, X as in xylophone. <laughs> C A T E Y F X at AOL.com. Uh, Rosie Stroop has just sent it out to all of our attendees and the panelists. Uh, so that's very generous. Thank you so much for that. And again, thank you. And please, um, if you might just put a, a little note, um, July 15th, we yep. will be presenting a play that has never been produced, The Droll by Meg Moroshnik. It's a wonderful it's play. It's a great it's play. A wonderful play, as is Bull Rusher. As yeah. is Bull oh, Rusher. Yeah. 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 Just, um, I'm, I'm yeah. beside myself that I get to see these plays. And uh, again, I want to thank you. And please tell people that this will be up on this site until Monday. So if you have friends okay. that you know you, they've got to see this, and I think everybody should, please tell them that they can still see this as well as the conversation until Monday. And thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. Yeah. Thank you very Josh, much. All right. Matthew, Miata, thank you, Paula, Lynn, and of course my dear old friend Kermit, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.